Hello, and welcome to a special edition of Up Close on METV. I'm Charles Clapsaddle, Station Manager for Manatee Educational Television. And on this edition of Up Close, we're very privileged to have with us two individuals to talk about a historic archive that is making great contribution to our community. And I want to welcome Mr. Richard Olson. Thank you, Richard, Charles. thank you very much for doing this. I, I certainly appreciate it, and I want to hear all the details about this very important archive. Thank you. I and also that. joining us today for another guest spot is Sonia Pressman Fuentes. Sonia, as you may know, is a renowned speaker and author and a survivor herself. So the significance of this conversation is to talk about the archive, the Ravensbrück Archive. First of all, Richard, Tell us, first of all, what Ravensbrück is, and we'll talk about the archive later, yeah. but where was Ravensbrück? Uh, Ravensbrück was a concentration camp about 55 miles north of Berlin, and it was built in 1939, only for women and children. Hmm. It was uh, in operation from 39 to 1945, and there was approximately 130,000 women that went through the camp hmm. throughout that time, and they were all used for slave labor. Hmm. That was the main thing, uh, to, to use the women to, to, to work them pretty much to death, unfortunately. From 1939, you know, even before you know, the United States and the war, people were being rounded up, women and children were being rounded up and sent to this concentration camp. That is correct, yeah. And they were all sent there for different reasons. It wasn't just Jewish women, mm -hmm. as we many, think, many times think of. When I first found out about it back in December of last year, 2014, I had never heard of Ravensbrück. When I start finding out more about it, and I realized that it was many different nationalities, many different religions, people there, homosexuals. Uh, yeah, it was a mixture. And I realized then that this could happen to me. I was born and raised in Sweden, have no Jewish connection, no Jewish background. So it really opened up my eyes. And I felt like I, I had lived in a bubble until mm. when I found that out, that it wasn't just Jewish. It was, it was anybody on this planet, really, that could have be locked up. And, and you know, the, the, the Third Reich was rounded up people that disagreed with their views, and uh, you know, these were people that weren't necessarily of the Jewish religion, Correct. but anybody that the, the Nazis opposed, they were rounded up and sent. Yeah. But this camp itself was very unique unto itself because it only contained women and children. Yeah, as far as we know, this, is, was, this was the only camp that was only built for women and operated this way. It was also a training uh, camp, so to speak, for Jewish female uh, SS officers. Hmm. They trained many women there and then they sent them out to other camps. Hmm. So, so that was also part of, of the Ravensbrück um, yeah. Wait, operation. I misunderstood something you said. You said Jewish women SS officers? Well, no, not Jewish, but there was a lot of German women that, that was okay, in training. Okay, you said Jewish, oh, that's I, what I, I didn't understand. Ger okay. Ger German uh, women who were trained to go and work in other camps. Correct. Well, let me yeah. ask you this. You know, the size of a camp like this must have been pretty immense uh, to, to facilitate handling all of those prisoners. I mean, can you give us an idea of the scope of the camp itself? The size of it? You know, I'm, I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very, just scratching the surface, I feel like. Back in December, I didn't know anything. And, and when we had our presentation here in town, when we actually brought some, some of the artifacts here, I, my opening speech, I said I knew nothing back in December. I know more now, but there's so much more to learn. Well, that brings the, us to, to the con concept originally, mm -hmm. is that uh, through uh, Lund University and the foundation, the archives have been discovered. And yeah. these archives consist of, of drawings and pictures and poems that were created by the inmates of the camp. That is correct. Yeah. Over this yeah. period of time from 39 to 45. Uh, yeah, if you want to talk about the archives, it was, it was um, when, when the women were rescued by the white buses into the South Sweden back at the end of the war, 1945, there was a Polish professor at the Lund University. He was a Polish lecturer. He, he collected artifacts, yeah. uh, and after a while he realized that there's so much more value that we need to gain from this. So he, he rounded up about 500 plus Polish, we, we assume Jewish women. We don't know because we're right now mm. opening well, the up 500 the- 500 were not Jewish. We, mm. no, we don't know. We don't know until we open up the archive, and we are working on it right now. So, so but, but he decided I need to 
take interviews. I need to interview these women. Right. So mm -hmm. he's, he was the, the brain behind the, the archive by realizing that we need to save this information. So him, he collected a, a work group and, and they together for like a year, they interviewed 500 plus women and each interview is about 10 pages. So we have 5,000 pages oh of gosh. just interviews plus the, the block books, the, the artifacts, meaning the diaries, the poems, the drawings, pictures, and, and other Nazi documents that the women took with them uh, at the liberation at the end yeah. of the war. I mean, it's got to be, in, in a way, in, in, in the size and the scope of this, it's got to be a little overwhelming to find this unattended for a period of time? Well, it was uh, the history of the archive after it was sealed because they, they needed to protect the women's name after mm -hmm. they so freely shared their experiences and names and dates and, and, and what happened there. The whole archive was sealed and back in 1947, the Polish professor had it hidden in his summer house in South Sweden, but it was a cold war coming up and they, they felt that it wasn't safe there. So they actually made an arrangement with uh, the university in, in California, Stanford University, they sent it to Stanford. Hmm. It, was, it was actually stored there, still sealed, from 1947 to approximately 1972, hmm. when it came back to, to, his, uh, to, to Lund, and, and he, he took care of it again. And an interesting thing, we actually found the Polish professor, his name was Zygmunt Lakosinski. We found his son, his name is Martin, lives in Dallas, and he actually sent us the original documents that was that was uh, uh, issued when they sent it to to uh, California to the to the muse to the um, university there and the whole the whole process. What a what a it, remarkable tale to have this material this wealth of material uh, boxed up sealed uh, you know for no one to see or study yeah. or to examine shipped from one part of the world to another, uh, still under seal, but protected. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I'm so blessed and so honored, not, not being from a Jewish background, which we always associate with the Holocaust, mm -hmm. me being born and raised in Sweden, like I said, and, and, and being given this opportunity to bring something like this important to the world, because it's, in my opinion, it's once in a lifetime. I mean, how often do you do you find something like this? How often do you get to work on something remarkable like this? And it, it is a remar remarkable achievement. And hats mm -hmm. off to you and your leadership and the vision for you know persevering and making sure that this archive is going to be something for the ages. Yeah. Now, Sonia, you. you know Richard you know, touched on something that was very important. I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Now, this is an important archive. As a survivor yourself, as someone who has been vitally uh, uh, involved with the Jewish community, but more so with the Holocaust. It's important to have this type of archive for historic purposes. Well, I absolutely agree with you, and I thought it might be helpful for the listeners to get a little bit of the background of this. Mm -hmm. um, all of this began towards the end of World War II, uh, when um, people in Sweden uh, began to think that uh, they had the idea of rescuing Scandinavian people from the concentration camps. So they worked with uh, Heinrich Himmler and others, yes, and uh, they uh, created, uh, Richard has uh, discussed the white buses. They right, decided exactly. to have uh, buses and they painted them white so they would be recognizable. And they went to the various concentration camps, mm. uh, particularly Ravensbrück, as far as we know, and they began to take people out of those camps. Mm. And they brought them to Sweden. Mm. And this is an interesting historical fact. This was the largest rescue operation during World War II. Mm. And many of those people who came to Sweden stayed there. Mm. Meanwhile, as Richard has also mentioned, there was a Polish professor named Zygmunt Lakosinski, and he had come to Lund University in Sweden. He was a lecturer in Polish, but he was a Polish man. So he got involved with these women who were coming from Ravensbrück to Lund University and to Lund, the city, and he uh, started working with them and then began the project of interviewing these women. He was Which both. had to be Herculean a task, you know, to sit mm -hmm. down with these women who have come out of uh, you know, depraved situation, to sit down with them and get their stories. I mean, uh, it, it had to be heartbreaking to hear some of these uh, 
these stories. Absolutely. And he's also somebody that wanted to go back to Poland when the war started to help his country, but he was talked out of it. Hmm. So he interviewed Polish women uh, who, were, who had come on the white buses to Lund, and he had a working group. And uh, in a little over a year, he had interviewed uh, about 500 women. Uh, I think just a, a small group of them were Jewish. Mm -hmm. uh, there were less than 10% uh, Jews, Jewish women in Ravensbrück. So mm -hmm. we're talking about, it's, this is not a Jewish matter, this is a matter for humanity. everybody. Yeah, right. humanity. And, and, and that's, you know, that's an excellent point, because I think most people would say you know, the concentration camps were specifically for people of Jewish origin, but that's not the case. There were, these were political prisoners, these were um, people that the Nazis didn't want, homosexuals or gypsies or whatever, whatever you know, they, they just rounded them up and put them in camps. The, the disturbing thing to me, and I, I really would like to hear both of yours in point of this, is this camp was unique unto itself because it was just women and children. And, it was ju and they were in forced labor, working for probably you know, munitions or whatever kind of thing. But just women and children forced in probably barbaric conditions. Share with us, if you can, uh, Richard, a little bit about you know, what you've seen from the archives that indicate the conditions that the women have, were, were in. Well, you know, uh, we like to call our campaign, we want to give the women the voices back. Hmm. And, and that, that's, uh, that's kind of our main focus. And, and, and there was one piece that, of the archive that we had come over here from Sweden back in, in June 30th, and there was a small man-made mirror it was in more than a, maybe two inch by two inch big, and it was was glued into a piece of p uh, paper that somebody was hiding somewhere throughout their clothing, and something I never thought about. But they didn't see; they couldn't see themselves. There was no such thing. They had, this lady had a little mirror. She had written a small little poem inside this mirror, and that's the only way she could see herself, mm. uh, because there was no such thing as mirrors as we are used to every day. You wake up mm. and you look in the mirror. Yes, yeah, small things like that. It's like, and 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 another thing that that maybe taken off the subject, but, but uh, when we had the, the main archivist, the, the professor from Sweden, coming and displaying and, and, and having the presentation for us, he, he said that if we, if we had a silent minute for each person that, that vanished in the Holocaust, we would be silent for 21 years. Yeah. These small things, I mean, you can read about, but there's, so, there's many small things that really brings it home. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, I, I personally ha only have seen a few pieces. I'm planning to go back in Sweden at the end of the, this year to, to actually see the 55 boxes worth of material that, that's been open one at a time right now. And, 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 and that uh, must be a task unto itself because, you know, being a university and the University Foundation, one has to be very exact and, and very careful with indexing and archiving each piece of material for historic purposes as well for academic purposes as well. Good point. The, the, right now we have two, uh, two Swedish, uh, Polish people in Sweden, Eva and Thomas, that's full time sitting and doing this and they have mentioned that this is the most important work they could ever think of doing in their lifetime. Yeah. Uh, and on top of that, when the injuries were taken, maybe you can fill me in, Sonia, but what, with the history of Lakosinski, there was something about when they, he took the interviews, he was very methodical, he was very precise, and he, each interview was read by a few different women that he hired that mm. actually came from Robinsburg. Uh. So he had it verified, so, so this uh. is very, very well documented originally, and of course right now we need to pay the utmost respect to these words by word and make sure we get it right. So, so they're very, very, yeah, on point. When, when and and precise to too. And I think from a, yeah. from a university's perspective, you know, that's how one researches and what that's one how documents uh, history is by uh, attribution and by double checking things. Correct. But Correct. but I would think also just the sheer volume of indexing this great collection is so critical, you know, mm -hmm. to the sustained importance of it. Yeah, we want to make it accessible for for historians, relatives, survivors, and so forth. So so it's going to be eventually 
eventually put out online. And then after that, that has been done, then our next step is to create the curriculum mm -hmm. as well as a traveling exhibit. Mm -hmm. And we are f uh, raising funds right now for the traveling exhibit that hopefully is going to take place in 2016 or 2017. Um, it, it will take a lot of time because of the size, as you mentioned, and also raising the funds for it. And another point you mentioned about Lund University, is actually they, they were one of the top 100 universities universities and they having their 350 year anniversary next year so they've what been a great around. way to celebrate yeah the, this, uh, this will the be, archive this will be one of the main event uh, at at the one year of, of anniversary celebrations that we're going to do or celebrations that we're going to do it, it's uh, yeah it, it, it's remarkable and, and uh, since i was involved or since i got involved with this which was back in march i i've i've quite quite a lot I met so many incredible people, like Sonia herself and her history. I mean, we could spend days and days here just to listen to her history. Very and and, so. and I've, I've been in touch with, with um, survivors that, that found me based on the, the article in the Sarasota Herald Tribune. And that's a unique and, story and, um, because you did and you hosted um, um, a program here in, in Sarasota where you talked about the archive and you had a few mementos from the archive yeah. and, and you actually had a, a survivor from Ravensbrück seek you out. Is yeah, that correct? That is correct. And that, that's got to be that's got to be quite a feeling for you to to meet one of those women. I I, I, um, I still have a, her voicemail. I still have it on my cell phone when she called me two days prior to the event. Uh, just to go back a little bit, uh, I was my my very close friend of mine is the chair of the the Ravensburg Archive in Los Angeles where we are based. Mm -hmm. He came out here in December and just shared this with me, and and I had no idea about this. Uh, I, I said I want to be on, be part of this, and I donated a large amount of money right up front because I, yeah, it just it's it just, was something uh, that made you, it struck. you know, want to do more. Yes, definitely. And and um, when I joined the 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 the, um, the board in in March, uh, he asked me, "Well, can we do something?" Because the professor is going to come over in, in June 28 to have a small presentation in Los Angeles. So I reached out to my friends here in, in the Jewish Federation in in Sarasota. And they said, pretty much, are you crazy? June, nobody's here. <laughs> and I said, well, if I can touch one soul, I'm happy. And, and um, my opening statement at, at that evening was that, uh, that um, if, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you haven't spent the night with a mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> and we had about close to 300 people that That's night. Wonderful. And, and That's it was, wonderful. It was incredible. It was. And, and Sonia, yeah. yeah you and there was, a, there was a wonderful uh, article in the Federation News that talks about the evening and it yeah. talks about the survivor that came forward. And, you know, and, and it, it had to be you know, incredibly moving uh, having known about the archives and you know, working with those to actually meet someone who has passed through those games. Well, when I got the phone call today, before, I mean, it, my phone was ringing off the hook. People wanted to attend at the last minute, and, and I got the phone call from Ivana Holovati in, in Venice. It was, it was incredible. I mean, if, yeah. I, I couldn't have, yeah, I couldn't have dreamt. I couldn't have created that. It's just, it's just beautiful. And and the thing that that she didn't really know about the Jewish Federation, the Jewish Federation here in town, who seems to have a very could check on, on the survivors here in town. Right. They did not know about Ivana. She uh, was not Jewish, so there was no reason. Exactly, and as you mentioned, she, this camp was, it, you it, know, had very few Jewish population. These were prisoners. These were just prisoners uh, yeah. of any of any denomination, of any race. They were just rounded up. Correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. she didn't agree with Hitler occupying Her Ukraine. Father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, so. Sonia, what during this event that you know you were an integral part of. Uh, 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 when you brought it in June, you know, it had to be a rewarding feeling for you to see and to expose uh, Sarasota and Manatee County to this wonderful opportunity to view these historic uh, artifacts and information. Well, it's been very interesting for me. As I told you before, I got involved uh, when I read in the Jewish News, I guess, that there was going to be a Holocaust program June 30th at the Jewish Federation. And it listed several names of people who were involved, and one was Richards. So I sent him a note and said, I look forward to your coming here. I thought he was in Sweden. <laughs> and I'm a Holocaust survivor, and I hope to attend your program. 
So he wrote back and said, let's have dinner. <laughs> so I thought, my goodness, he's coming from Sweden to have <laughs> It turns out well, he lives in Siesta Key. Well, see, but he would have come from Sweden to have I dinner have no with doubt. you. Definitely. I'm sure he would have. Definitely. So. so since then, I've been involved with Richard, his lovely wife, Bibi, and the program. And um, I have a lot of connections. Mm -hmm. And I've been using them to further this program. I spoke to Billy Cox, a writer for the Herald Tribune, mm -hmm. which is why there was an article in the Herald Tribune, which is why uh, Ivana called Richard. Mm -hmm. Correct. So it's been gratifying to to be a part of it. And then, as and, I'm and it, it must be, you know, and and you know, I, I must say again, you know, you know, hats off to uh, Lund University and Lund University Foundation for for taking the leadership role in making sure that this archive is not only retained but you know continues to be accessible, will be accessible okay. to the public. And it's it's a it's a remarkable thing that the that the foundation and you sir are doing for for a greater community. You know, everybody. Has heard of you know like the Auschwitz and the Buchenwalds and and those camps you know that have you know just this horror story, but those this camp that was just for women and just for children, one can only imagine the horror and the deprivation that they went through. So these small archives, these oral histories that have been preserved, the mementos and the memorabilia. And one thing that you mentioned, Richard, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about it, the, the German uh, journals that were kept, because I'm sure the Germans kept very, very good records, and you refer to it as a block book? Block book. And tell us what that was. Block book, that's a German, you might know what that means, block book. But I think it was a book that described each each um, building inside the camp. Oh, the buildings were called blocks. Maybe. Yeah, blocks. Each block, a block book, a block booken, I think in German, uh, and and they kept very well documented everything. I mean, it was it was it was. You understand the the, the size and the and the the organization that was, was behind this, the way they kept records of mm. women coming and women going and, and being killed at the end of the war when they built the, the gas chamber because mm. they did not have a gas chamber until the end of the war there. Mm. And, 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 and uh, yeah, the, the, the precise documents, I mean, the handwriting and, and just looking at it and, and, and it's, it's hard to fathom and it's hard to understand and, and comprehend how, how they could have such an organization just yeah, killing these women and and and, 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 them to and death. again and again, you know, I mean, the, the depravity of uh, the uh, Nazis you know, goes without saying. But when when this is visited upon women and children, uh, you know, it reaches new heights of that. Um, and Richard, this question is for you. As Lund continues to expand and develop the archive, what is your, and you talked briefly about, you know, traveling exhibit and archiving, what is your vision? What would you like to see this archive become? You know, I see this as a tool for, for all of us on this planet to get together. Because now suddenly it wasn't just for Jewish people. It mm -hmm. could have been me and you, like I said before. Exactly. I don't know your background, but but I know I'm not Jewish, so it could have been me. Could be my family. Okay. Suddenly the audience is everybody, and it's it's it's. I'm I'm gonna. I kind of devoted my the rest of my life for this. It has become so so close to my heart for many different reasons, and and I want to use this as a vehicle to to embrace our differences. You know, th there's such big need of that. We're so quick, quick to judge people because they're all different. Mm. And I just saw an, an interview yesterday about a Swedish survivor from Bergen-Belsen who actually was rescued by the white buses back in July of 1945. She lives in Stockholm. And I just sent mm. her an email this morning. I'm trying to reach out to her. And, and, and she said, this is so important. This needs to be shared from mouth to mouth. Yes. You can read about it. You can see movies about it and so forth, which I had done until December. It wasn't until now when I realized the, the, the size of this that involves all of us. So again, uh, I'm so honored to, 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 to be part of this. And if I can use this as, as a vehicle to bring us all closer. And, and I'm, just as a side story, I remember back in 9-11, when that happened here in the United States, uh, I was working as a window washer back then. And, and suddenly overnight, everybody became so nice and friendly to each other because right. we had one enemy to, to fight. Very much so. So everybody came together. And, and uh, yeah, I, I don't want anything worse to happen than it already has. I mean, we have mm -hmm. plenty of situation that Holocaust, 9-11, why do we have to wait for these significant things to occur? Yeah, for, in order for us to connect and, and say, hey, you might be white, I might be black, 
you, you had a different, a different accent. We are one human being. And, 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 and I think that's very important to say, and you, know, you said it very eloquently, is that you know, the, the, the retention of the memory as well, uh, that Correct. collective memory that passes from one generation, as you said, you know, from mouth to mouth, mm -hmm. it's very important to never forget. Uh, never forget man's inhumanity to man, never forget the cruelty that man has visited on his fellow man. And I think the work that Lund uh, continues to do, and you continue to do, is so admirable that people will never forget. You know, if one sits and reads a poem in, uh, from, a, from a child that was uh, imprisoned in uh, Ravensbrück, you know, that might be you know, a, a bit of an awakening for someone else to say, listen, we can't help let this happen. Correct. Sonny, what do you want to see? What do you want this uh, the Robbins book uh, archive to become? Well, I want it to become what its goal is, which is to make these testimonies available to the entire world by putting them on the internet. Mm -hmm. And that is the goal of this program. Mm -hmm. They are going to translate these 500 interviews from Polish to English, mm -hmm. And then they're going to digitize them and put them on the internet, and they'll be available to everybody. I think that's remarkable. You know, make it mm -hmm. available to everybody for school students, for community uh, leaders. You know, all of this is you know, this kind of insight into people that were imprisoned and brutalized. You know, what a what a a great kind of awakening this to be to see, to, to to look at that historic documents that are going to be made available. Now we only have a couple of minutes left, and we've barely touched on a variety of things. Things. But I would welcome both of you to come back at you know maybe a future day to talk more about you know the the, the Robbins book archive and other things that you're possibly involved in. But I think the key thing is, and Sonia, you've been involved in it for many many years, is the fact you know that it's very important to remember, uh, to remember the brutality, to remember and not forget. Uh, and I think the the through Lund University and the foundation, that's kind of what they're after is to make sure that this. Yeah. This material is there for everyone to see. And Richard, I would I would welcome you back. Obviously, you know, your kind of vision and leadership has really making this Ravensbrück ar archive move forward. And not only you should be applauded for your efforts, but for the continued support that you have done and the leadership that you've provided in making sure that the world has access to the Ravensbrück archive. I'm honored. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us. And Sonia, it's always pleasure. a pleasure to see you. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. For additional information, we have some uh, information up on the screen for Richard to be uh, to contact Richard or to look at Lund University Foundation and to find out additional information uh, for you to look into and on the Ravensbrück Archive. We want to thank Richard Olson and Sonia Pressman Fuentes for joining us today. And we would welcome them back at any opportunity to talk more about this significant archive. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on METV.